Hello to all of my Marvel and DC geeks, Dante D here, and welcome to another edition of Geekery with Dante D. This is the place where we talk about comic books and other geek stuff. If you are listening to this as a podcast, please, at some point, go and check out our YouTube channel. And if you are watching this as a video, try out the podcast, see if you like it, maybe listen to this lovely voice on the way to work. Today, we're going to be uh, talking about an ages old rival rivalry. And by ages old, I mean since the 1960s, and that is between Marvel and DC. It's kind of like one of those locker room discussions, like, you know, who would win Hulk or Superman? This is like, who would win Marvel or DC? Uh, but I have to say there is a clear answer to that. And that is Marvel. Short answer of it, it, it is Marvel. Uh, there have been uh, certain points throughout comic book history, really since the 1960s, where DC has come out ahead for very brief periods of time, but they oftentimes found it very difficult to keep their advantage over Marvel. Marvel always ends up getting the the upper hand over DC, they always end up surpassing DC, whether it be in, in sales, popularity, whatever. Today, we're going to be discussing why. Why is that? Why is Marvel always beating DC? And why will Marvel always be ahead of DC? Well, let's find that out today. And let's just jump right in to this discussion. So there are a number of reasons why Marvel is always coming out ahead of DC, okay? But we're going to have to really go back and examine the history between these two companies and the history of these two companies in order to kind of get a clear idea of why Marvel is, you know, number one. Well, it wasn't always that way. Back in, from the golden age all the way up to the 1960s, it actually was DC Comics that was the biggest player in the industry with their sales. They had these massive titans like Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman. They were always topping the sales charts. For a while, DC was dethroned by uh, EC Comics, but during that period between the 1930s all the way up to the 1960s, it was mostly DC and Marvel, which at the time was called Timely Comics, uh, never really, they, they failed really to become significant and even relevant in the industry. Okay, they were, they were always just kind of playing follow the leader with, uh, with books. And what I mean by follow the leader, they were just trying to do, they were just trying to capitalize on whatever was popular at the time. And they were just trying to do what other publishers were doing in order to make their profits. It wasn't until Marvel comics became Marvel comics and Stan Lee last launched this massive universe of incredibly popular and incredibly complex superheroes that DC started raising an eyebrow and really started being concerned for their position in the comic book industry. So throughout the 1960s and the 1970s, DC, uh, they were still doing quite well with characters like Batman and Superman, Wonder Woman, but Marvel was catching up and they became increasingly popular. Okay, with Spider-Man, the Avengers, Fantastic Four, Hulk, Iron Man, like, you know, those amazing, amazing Marvel characters. And they really were giving DC Comics a lot of trouble. And it finally came to the point where DC was in big trouble in terms of sales and popularity when it came to comparing them to Marvel Comics. And even to this day, DC still manages to only stay as a close second behind Marvel. 
Marvel is always, always ahead. Now, again, there have been a few times over the past few years and the, a few times throughout history where DC was coming out ahead of Marvel, okay? Most recently, I'm thinking the new 52. Uh, I know for a while when DC launched, relaunched their whole universe, this was about 10 years ago, and we actually will be talking about the new 52 in an upcoming video, but 10 years ago, DC relaunched their whole line of comics they relaunched their whole whole universe with the new 52 with 52 brand new comics and this was a very daring initiative and dc actually came out on top for a while they were beating marvel however that lead did not last very long other points in history where DC was coming out ahead. I'm thinking uh, 1986 was a bad year for Marvel, uh, but 1986 was a great year for DC. And for those of you that know a little bit about comic book history, that was the year we got Watchmen and uh, Dark Knight Returns. But it wasn't just because of Watchmen and Dark Knight Returns. DC had had really did a lot back in the 1960s, or sorry, in the 1980s. Uh, in 1986 and, and going forward to kind of redefine their characters for the new age. And for a while, that was really working out for them. They uh, they were doing amazingly with their books and they were essentially beating out Marvel. But again, these leads never lasted. If there are any other times uh, in recent history, and by, by recently, I'm talking like the last 30, 40 years where DC was kind of beating out Marvel, uh, let me know. I'd love to hear from you because those are the big two uh, that really come to mind uh, as I'm sitting here chatting about it. But again, let's go back and ask, why is that? Why can't DC stay on top with their characters? Why can't they stay on top with their, with their line of comics? Now, Paul Levitz, who was the publisher of uh, DC Comics, he had said one time uh, to Rob Liefeld, you know, you know what, Rob? I don't care to be number one. I want to be the best number two. I'm going to be the best number two there is. And that is kind of clever, and I understand why he would say that, because if you become number one with DC Comics and inevitably you get surpassed by Marvel... People are going to start asking questions. Why were you number one? And now you're number two. He said, you know, if you stay a good number two, you show them that, you know, your books are selling okay and everyone's doing fine and doing well at the company, then your job is fine. So, so Paul Levitz was pretty smart there. I think he even knew that, you know, it's hard to stay number one as DC. And I think there are two huge factors that really kind of explain to us why why DC can never maintain the number one spot. The first is I think the family of comics and the types of characters that each of these respective companies are publishing. What do I mean by that exactly? Well, each company have their flagship characters. So for example, you know, like Marvel has Spider-Man. They have uh, they have their Avengers line of books. They have their X-Men books, okay? So they have all these different family of books that get kind of spun off from these more popular characters. So, you know, for example, for Spider-Man, Okay, yeah, Spider-Man's very popular, but, you know, now you have Venom books. Uh, you have these Miles Morales books, so on and so forth. For a while, you had Spider-Gwen, right? These are all in the Spider-Man family of books. How many X books are there, right? Those all kind of spun off from, from the X-Men. With DC, you only have really one relevant family of comics, 
And those of you that are listening and watching right now, you know what family of comics I'm talking about. And those are the Batman comics. So really, there is only one family of comics over at DC that is relevant. But Marvel has numerous families of comics that do well. And they're able to capitalize on the popularity of these particular characters by spinning off these titles, doing spinoff titles. With DC, they really only can spin off Batman because Batman is essentially their their only really popular character. Now, of course, we have Superman, but honestly, we and we have Wonder Woman as well and all these other um, ones like Green Lantern and Flash, whatever. But it's 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 Batman really that makes their money for them. Batman books sell very very well, but it, it, if you look at the list of DC Comics' current publications, you can look at everything they're printing and think this company should not be called DC. This you know this this company should be called Batman Comics essentially. Kind of like Archie Comics, right? Like Archie Comics really kind of prints Archie-related books and Archie spinoffs. DC really should be named Batman Comics because most of their books are all Batman. Let's look, take a look at DC Comics' current publications. So when you think DC, you're thinking Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Flash, Green Lantern, uh, those characters there. So let's look. So they currently have uh, 23 books ongoing series as of the time that this this video slash podcast is being made. So we have Action Comics. They're on volume three. We have Batman. They're on volume three with Batman. There's Batman Urban Legends. That's volume one. Catwoman, volume four. Deathstroke, volume one. Detective Comics, Flash. Future State Gotham, Green Lantern, Harley Quinn, I Am Batman, Joker, Justice League, Looney Tunes, Nightwing, Robin, Scooby-Doo, Suicide Squad, Superman, Son of Kal-El, which has been in the news lately. Uh, You would know that if you listen to the... um, uh, actually, sorry, watched the episode on uh, the bisexual Superman that we did. I'm actually going to have to post that on the podcasts. Uh, I don't think I've, I've done that yet. But anyway, I digress. Teen Titans, Wonder Girl, and Wonder Woman. So, when you look at this list, you count up these books. Out of the 23 books that you have here... 13 of those books are from the Batman family of comics. That's 56%. 56% of Marvel, or sorry, of DC's publications are Batman related books. So you have a title like Catwoman. That's a Batman related book. Okay. Um, Let's see here. Future State Gotham. Anything with Gotham in it. Uh, Batman and Urban Legends. These are all Batman related books. Harley Quinn and Joker those titles those are batman family of books right robin batman nightwing that's a batman family book Uh, i mean heck you can even make an argument for suicide squad and uh and justice league because uh the batman mythos plays a huge role in uh in those titles as well so 56 percent, 56 percent of dc's publications of their 23 books currently are Batman family books, okay? Now, if you look at Marvel and their current list of publications, sorry, I'm just pulling up the lists here. So Marvel is currently publishing 32 books. They are Alien, The Amazing Spider-Man, Avengers, Black Panther, Black Widow, Captain Marvel, Eternals, Excalibur, Fantastic Four, Hulk, Iron Man, Marauders, The Marvels, Miles Morales, Spider-Man, Moon Knight, New Mutants, Savage Avengers, Shang-Chi, Spider-Woman, 
Star Wars, Star, Star Wars Bounty Hunter, Star Wars Darth Vader, Star Wars Dr. Aphra, Star Wars The High Republic, Strange Academy, SWORD, Thor, Venom, Wolverine, X-Force, X-Men, and X-Men Legends. 32 of those books, okay? So uh, the major families that I found with Marvel are, you have the X-Books, which you have six X-Men related books. You have the Avengers, there are two Avengers related books. The Spider-Man family of comics, that there's there are uh, four books in that family. And then we have Star Wars. Uh, you have five books in the Star Wars family of comics. So you have one big family at DC and you have four big families at Marvel. Huge, huge difference, right? And that is really one of the main reasons why Marvel's always going to come out ahead. Because, like, if you look at Marvel's other books, they have so many different titles. Like, it, even in different um, different genres as well. Like, they have a huge variety of books. DC, it's really, really heavily superhero focused. And it's... Batman is the variety and the popularity of the characters. So at DC, they're really only interested in one family of comics, and that's Batman. Okay. Uh, I mean, heck, they're trying gimmicks to try to bring other families and other characters at DC um, to prominence, i.e., Superman. But I won't get into that right now. But at Marvel, people are hugely invested in X Men, they're hugely invested in Avengers, they're hugely invested in Spider Man. Star Wars, okay? Uh, Hex printing those Star Wars books is uh, probably one of the best moves uh, they could have made, you know, getting that licensing back. And of course, it's all because they all fall under the umbrella of, uh, of Disney. So basically, it's diversification of these portfolios, okay? I mean, I don't know anything about finances, but you want to diversify your portfolio to be successful. That's the same thing when it comes to comic books. You have a lot more diversity, and I don't mean social justice diversity, but you have a lot more diversity with characters and families over at Marvel in comparison to at DC where you just have one, and that's Batman. The market at DC is literally saturated with Batman books, and I'm not complaining. I love Batman. Batman's one of my favorite superheroes, but uh, I'm sure there are a lot of you out there that from the DC line of comics, you're only reading Batman. Back when I was actively buying new comics, uh, it was mostly just Batman books that I was buying from the DC line. I wasn't even paying attention to any of the other ones. Everything else was Marvel. And for Marvel, I was buying a variety of books. Heck, even if you look at my my collection, my uh, my, my retro collection, comics from the Silver Age and the, Bron and the Bronze Age, they are... Uh, they're mostly all Marvel. And then I have a lot of Batman. <laughs> so it's Marvel and Batman. I think that lack of diversity that uh, that DC has with their characters and the types of books that they print uh, really does kind of hurt them. So currently, as of the recording of this video, Marvel currently owns 39.98% of the comic book market share and DC is uh, owns 29.33% of the market share. That's a huge difference. Uh that is like a big 10% difference in in market share is is huge, okay? But it's not just the uh the family of comics and and uh the diversification and the diversity of, of the characters and the books that they're printing that I think um, hurts DC. It's also the philosophies of the companies, okay? Uh, DC characters, although there are a lot of them that I love, but I think overall the DC characters 
are very dated. You have to think, most of the characters that DC uh, prints, they're all products of the Depression era, okay? All of the DC characters were created primarily during, all, all the popular ones anyway, uh, were created during the Great Depression. So we have Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, those those characters there are products of uh, the Depression era, of Depression era America, but they're also products of the modern age. And I don't mean modern in terms of like, oh yeah, I'm so modern, right? No, I mean uh, modern in terms of the uh, the philosophical and the artistic movement. Okay, so the modernism. Okay, essentially, I'm going to give you the. I don't want to get too much into this, but modernism is uh, a movement in art and literature, so on and so forth, that started in the 1800s and it carried out all the way through to, uh, it had its peak during the 1960s, okay? And the basic idea of modernism is it's a utopian vision of human life and society and a belief in progress or moving forward. Okay, sound familiar? That's DC characters in a nutshell. You know, DC has always been very kind of black and white. Superman is good. Lex Luthor is bad. Okay, and those early stories uh, really kind of are boring because it's just, you know, you have your good character, your bad character, no complexity whatsoever. As a matter of fact, the only character from the golden age that can actually read is Batman because those are a little bit more uh, complex. And I think it's Batman really is the only character at DC that doesn't fit nicely in that modernist type um, package. Because Batman is really the only character at DC relevant character at DC. That's 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 gray. He's a great character. He's not black or white. Superman is black or white. Uh, Wonder Woman is black or white. Green Lantern, Flash. These are all characters that struggle for that utopian vision of of life. Superman, especially. He's the uh, he's the goody goody, right? Everyone knows that uh, Superman's the goody goody over at DC. But Wonder Woman also kind of embodies that. There's no gray. Again, all black or white. And they're all struggling for this utopian vision of human life. And they're all struggling for the progress of society. Marvel, on the other hand, their characters are products of a different era, the 1960s. If you look at the 1960s, the 1960s, things really kind of flipped for um, values, beliefs, everything in uh, in America, okay? And the 1960s is really kind of when we get this, the beginning of this new movement where we're getting postmodernism, okay? And I think the Marvel characters fit in a postmodernist type box perfectly. Okay. And what is postmodernism? Okay. The main idea of postmodernism is there's no objective reality. Okay. So there's always gray. There's nothing, nothing's black or white. There's always gray. No objectivity. No scientific or historical truth. Science technologies, science and technology are not necessarily vehicles of human progress, but suspect instruments of established power. Whoa, sound familiar? All of these Marvel characters were born out of anxieties that came out of the atomic age, right? All of these heroes that Marvel was creating, they, they were all, you know, like look at Hulk. He's a product of um, atomic anxiety. Spider-Man, radioactive spider, right? So Stan Lee was looking at what was going on in the world and kind of looking at it like, you know, this is not necessarily a great thing. Like there's a lot of devastation that happened from nuclear research. So 
you can basically look at that as, you know, DC characters are more modernist and Marvel characters are more, more postmodern. Or you can look at it as DC characters, black or white, and Marvel characters are gray. Marvel characters are more complex, okay? Marvel characters are more relatable, okay? Uh, I mean, I just keep thinking back to the to the old uh, Superman shows and radio shows and, you know, Superman fights a never-ending battle for truth, justice, and the American way, right? Like, it's like, can you get any more goody-goody? Can you get any more modernist and any more, you know, you know, this is good. There's nothing wrong with, you know, this. It's it's just, for some people, it just kind of makes them want to throw up, right? <laughs> So that's exactly, that's essentially what I mean by DC characters are dated. They're a product from an era where, you know, things were really just kind of black or white and Marvel characters are a product of an era where thing, where they started looking at things as more gray. Uh, and again, Marvel more relatable, DC not so much, but again, Batman is the only character that kind of flirts with that line batman is the only character that can be uh gray as opposed to black or white and he's the most complex maybe the even the most relatable character at uh at dc so that's why dc i don't blame them they're capitalizing on their most popular character the one that people want to read and people want to read batman characters because they're the ones that don't have powers they're the ones that are a little bit more gray they're the ones that you know people want to see but marvel has a lot more of those characters so that's essentially why marvel's always going to be ahead they just have more of these postmodern complex characters that's really all i have to say about that i would love to hear what you all think about this battle between marvel and dc and why marvel will always come out ahead please let me know in the comments if you're listening to this as a podcast reach out to me uh on social media at geekery d i'm on twitter i'm on instagram i'm also on tumblr again that's at geekery d Thank you for joining me here today. I really always enjoy having these discussions and interacting with you and hanging out with all of you. Till next time, this is Dante D signing off. I will see you all in the next episode. Take care.